start? Cool. Hey everyone, how are you guys doing today? Good. Um, cool. Well, my name is Arjun. Uh, I lead sales and customer success at a company called Scarf. And uh, surprise, surprise, we do what I would deem responsible open source usage data collection. Um, I've been around startups for a while. I have co-founded a few myself. I've worked at a bunch. And probably the most consistent thing that I've noticed is that when those startups are successful, it's because we were following the usage of our product very closely. Um, this happens in a variety of different ways. So you, know, you talked about that stuff when you report data to investors. You talk about that stuff when you're trying to understand uh, what employees should be doing when you're making any kind of strategic decisions. And uh, in all these different contexts, when we were following the data, we were making our best decisions. So when I first entered the open source world, I was really surprised. I was like, okay, I assume that there must be some amount of product usage data. Um, and as it turns out, the vast majority of open source projects, the most that they know is maybe the number of GitHub stars that they have. Uh, it's kind of like knowing the number of likes you have on social media. It doesn't really tell you all that much. Maybe they know at most like the number of total downloads that their, their project might have. It's just very, very minimal uh, as far as the data that you have. And it, it makes it really difficult to make decisions. So yeah, before I get into this topic, a uh, quick audience poll and a quick uh, disclaimer is that nothing in this is considered legal advice. So you know, definitely talk to your own legal team if you have any questions about how this could affect you specifically. But yeah, quick audience poll, because I'm curious out of the people here, does anybody here maintain open source projects? Nice. Uh, anybody here a startup founder? OK. Does anybody here work at companies that are involved with like use open source or maintain open source? Imagine that's got to be most people. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, well, I guess the question that I would post to you, and also, yeah, feel free to jump in with questions if you have any. Or I guess if that's not okay with the format, then that's fine. We can ask them later too. But um, yeah, the question I'd ask is, how does your business answer questions about open source software? Something to think, to think about. Questions that might come to mind would be stuff like, who are our users? Where in the world are our users? Um, what kinds of features are they using on a day-to-day -day basis? And what versions are they using and not using? When you're trying to make decisions, whether they're product decisions or business decisions about the open source, how do you actually make those data-driven decisions? Uh, what companies are using our open source? Are they companies at all, or is it mostly just individual developers you know, tinkering around with the product? These are questions that are, historically speaking, not very easy to answer in open source. And I would argue that the most common way that open source projects actually try to answer these questions uh, is with surveys. So yeah, why is it hard to track these things? And that's because I think surveys are probably one of the most common ways. So uh, at SCARF, we work with a lot of projects that are in some of the big open source foundations, like the Linux Foundation, the Apache Software Foundation, things like that. And I was talking to one of these projects earlier this week, actually, and they were saying that basically every quarter or so, they'll send out a survey to all their users and try to gather some data around who those people are and what they're doing with the project. And at best, they get a tenth of a percent of their total users to fill out that survey. So, I mean, this is like, what are we doing here? You know, like open source developers are some of the most technologically sophisticated people in the world. And yet, we're relying on manual surveys to try to gather data about how they're using our software. I would say that most of the people who are using it are probably not going to fill them out. Um, it's just notoriously difficult to write. Uh, a survey about your product that isn't biased in some way or another, whether it's bias on your part or bias on the part of how people will respond to it. They may have some preferences that are related to their users of the product, but the way they respond to that survey may not actually reveal those true preferences. Um, and ultimately, you know, to the first point here, if only a very, very small percentage of your users are actually filling out that survey, it's not a representative sample of how your entire user base is using the software. The next thing I would say, which is probably a concern that many people here have heard before, is that the conventional wisdom in open source is that users just don't want to be tracked. Uh, this is something that a ton of projects have run into whenever they've tried to implement some amount of 
usage tracking. This is whether it's you know big companies that are maintaining open source projects that do this. Even indie developers have tried to do it to understand more about it, and um, they have heard a lot of pushback at various times. Um, I'll dive into this a bit more later in the talk, but this is something that I think is worth exploring a bit, especially as you think about uh, the time period we live in. Um, many of you may know about some of the license changes that have been happening in open source recently, and uh, many of you may be concerned about that. And I think um, these two problems are interrelated. Like the idea that people are trying to get something back to learn about their open source, and the idea that the standard traditional model for open source hasn't uh, played nicely with that idea. Anyway, something to think about, and we'll kind of talk more about that throughout the slides. And uh, yeah, I guess this kind of gets to the point that at the end of the day, the community in open source is really important, making sure that you have a strong relationship with that community, and communities are fickle. They uh, have changing expectations, and they don't want you to do things that they don't want you to do, and uh, you don't want to ever try to re risk that reputation with them. So yeah, I would say it's, it's a lot of barriers to collecting this kind of data, but I would say that there are also a lot of benefits to doing so, and I think it's worth considering what those benefits are. Um, so first, I would say that in reality, you may actually be overestimating the amount of unpopularity that this kind of stuff receives. Um, there are projects that have been doing open source telemetry and uh, usage data tracking for many, many years. So like NPM is an example of this where every single time you use NPM, they're collecting personally identifiable information about you. Uh, this has been happening for a while. So I think that uh, immediately begs the question like, it may not be a question of is this okay or is this not okay? It's maybe more of a question of what situations is this okay under and when are we the users okay with people doing this? I think this kind of brings up the idea of expectation fit, which is a phrase that we use a lot at SCARF. Um, I'm just gonna define this phrase for you real quick. So if you have a product and you release a new feature and some of the people in your community, uh, they look at that feature and maybe they like it, maybe they don't, but it matches what they envision in their head about your product, it kind of matches their expectations, then that's an example of something that has high expectation fit. So people are really unsurprised by the product feature, whether or not they like it. Um, if it does not, then that would be low expectation fit. So as this pertains to uh, usage metrics, there's a couple of examples that come to mind. Uh, for example, service access, server access logs. So let's say that you are downloading your software from some external place, some registry, like a container registry or whatever. Um, when you go to fetch that software, you know that you have to go to some third party place to track to, to get that software. Um, or even when you like just browse a website, you know that you're going to some third party place to do that. So most of the time people expect that in doing so, they'll have to, um, they'll, they'll some basic amount of something will be tracked from them when they do that because uh, people may want to know that this is uh, like a real person doing it rather than, I don't know, some type of spam or whatever. So that's an example of high expectation fit. On the other hand, telemetry, uh, where you see people start to do tracking after the point of installation, maybe they're doing some type of heartbeat, maybe they're doing some type of tracing. This is an example of something that has a lot more variable expectation fit. The reason I would say variable is because um, in the past, I would say that this had had much lower expectation fit. Nowadays, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, so an anecdote that comes to mind here is Scarf in one of our earliest iterations was actually offering a JavaScript package dependency where if you had some JavaScript package on NPM, uh, you could add scarf.js as a dependency and you'd be able to track uh, download statistics. And at first, when this was released, it was extremely popular. A bunch of people were downloading it. A lot of super popular React projects and other NPM projects were using it. And then very shortly afterwards, there was community backlash. So yeah, you can see, you can, you can go search this online. There's a bunch of examples of people saying, remove scarf, remove scarf.js. Um, and this is about five years ago or so. And I would say that at the time, that had a very low expectation fit. But nowadays, this is no longer the case. So we, as I mentioned, we work with a lot of Linux Foundation projects, ASF projects, and uh, this screenshot here, which may be hard to see, it's a little bit small font, but 
this is from the internal discussion happening at Apache Airflow, which is one of the most popular ASF projects, in which we were doing the exact same type of telemetry. We were doing telemetry after the point of download uh, during the actual uh, usage of the software. And all of these maintainers are just saying, yeah, plus one, this sounds great, this sounds reasonable, this sounds really useful. And I think this really speaks to the idea that expectations can change over time and that uh, you should be paying attention to what those expectations are because um, if you know that they are not going to match what you're going to do, then you're likely to have a bad expectation fit and that's going to be a strong predictor of what those reactions look like, even when the data that's being collected in both of these cases was actually exactly the same. Um, the second thing I would say is that you're probably underestimating how valuable the data can be and how valuable your community is. It's, it's probably not a controversial statement to say that your open source community is your most valuable asset, your most important asset. Um, but what is maybe not considered as much is that the ways that you're probably interacting with your community right now, the traditional ways to interact with them, are insufficient. So traditionally, you interact with these people directly. So maybe they come to you with a problem. They raise an issue on GitHub. Maybe they even try to contribute to the project and they start to interact in that way. Uh, maybe they start to join some you know, community Slack or Discord or whatever, or they come to real life events. But ultimately, this kind of goes back to the same problem that surveys pose, is that it's, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, this is 1% you know, of people maybe, or maybe even less than that, that comprise your total amount of users. And without knowing what all those other users are doing, it's just not giving you a very representative sample of how your product is being used and what you need to be prioritizing. So most of the people, the vast majority of people will, uh, it's kind of like, if you guys are familiar with the phrase lurker on Instagram, it's somebody who just uh, looks at Instagrams or any social media, I guess, and just watches people's you know, stories and posts but never actually posts anything. Like, that's most people. Most people are just gonna be downloading your code. They're still using it, uh, but they're not actually gonna interact with you directly. And if you don't understand how those people are using your software, you're not gonna be able to make it better for them. Yeah, I would actually argue that it's it's maybe even irresponsible to not take them into account just because they aren't interacting with you directly. They are just as important members of the community and their usage patterns deserve just as much seat at the table. And the third thing I would say is that it's just not enough to rely on vanity metrics. So Apache Superset, this is another super popular ASF project. And as you can see, they have thousands and thousands of stars. They have hundreds of millions of downloads. And uh, before we started working with them. This is basically the, the gist of what they knew about their usage. And when you really look at this, I mean, what does this tell you? Basically, all this tells you is that it's a really popular project, but it doesn't tell you anything about how it's being distributed and which of those distribution methods are being used. It doesn't tell you anything about the versions that are being used or where in the world those users are. There's just so much going on behind the scenes here that is obfuscated that, um, I think once you really start to dig into those deeper metrics, it makes it clear how surface level these ones are. So yeah, I would make the argument that you should collect this data, um, but we know that there are some barriers. And I think the question is not uh, whether or not this is uh, a thing that should be done in today's environment, and more so, what are the right ways to do it, and what are the things that should be considered when you're doing it? So some of the things that come to mind are who should have access to the usage data once you have it? How should this data be used? And uh, who should be using it? How should it be stored? You know, what kinds of compliance implications come to mind and how does privacy play a piece in this? And how is consent managed? And uh, yeah, that's kind of the things that we'll go into in this topic. So the first thing I would say is that you should handle PII sensitively. So, okay, what is PII? PII, personally identifiable information. Basically, it's just any information that can uniquely identify an individual. Um, and there are a lot of different things that you can do with PII. Um, Generally speaking, if you are not storing it, that helps you solve a lot of those problems. Um, and you can still get quite a lot of value without storing the PII. So you can collect it and get some information around it and then get rid of it. Uh, that's actually what SCARF does. So for example, when we collect information around IP addresses, which are considered PII, 
uh, we then enrich some information about it, and then we get rid of the IP addresses. So uh, keeping your hands off of the PI as much as possible will definitely make your life easier. Um, an analogy that I like to pose here is PII, handling PII is kind of like how um, an environmentalist might think about their meat consumption. So it doesn't necessarily need to be black and white. It's not just like you eat meat, you're bad, you don't eat meat, you're good. It's, there's a scale and like reducing your level of meat will definitely have a better environmental impact. So like reducing the amount of PII that you're collecting will make your life probably easier and storing it temporarily rather than permanently will also make your life easier. There's definitely a scale to these things. And of course, when you are collecting it, making sure that you're encrypting it and uh, treating it with all the necessary security precautions is gonna be important. Um, on that note, complying with the GDPR is pretty hot topic when it comes to PII. Um, I would say that the GDPR is an interesting law because it is very comprehensive, but it also um, provides some really specific assurances that are worth reading into. Um, for example, there is this concept of a legitimate basis within the GDPR, which is basically what can allow you to collect PI in some type of open source environment. And yeah, I guess there are a lot of different things that constitute legitimate basis. Again, it's worth talking to your legal team about that. But I guess the, the bottom line here is that some of these things are actually more achievable to collect from a legal perspective than, than you might imagine. And you know, there are some things that you need to pay attention to. Like, of course, if you have cookies that you're collecting, then make sure you have a cookie notice. But um, some of the other pieces of it may be actually easier to, to abide by than you're expecting. And also, uh, you should just pay attention to, you know, if you're going to be the one doing all this analytics collection, just make sure that you know how to handle these different pieces of it. So we often find there are companies who have been attempting, or projects, open source projects as well, that have been attempting to collect analytics for a long time. And ultimately, they come to a company like Scarf and they say, you know what, it's just easier for you to deal with these problems because, you know, we don't want to have to worry about where's our liability when it comes to this data that we're collecting? Um, or we're trying to gather some information and try to enrich some of that information, but we're working with these sub-processors who are like taking our data and doing stuff with it, and we can't make them comply with the same things that we need to comply with, so you just handle it. Um, and similarly, just paying attention to where you as the data controller and the data processor, where that line ends and where it begins. Um, these are things that are really worth paying attention to. The next thing I would say is that you need to provide options to opt out. Um, and you know, I think this is probably no surprise to most of the folks here, but uh, opting out is something that is considered just standard in any open source environment. The thing that you need to consider though as well is that different open source environments, different software environments will have different uh, conditions that may allow for different opt-out possibilities. So um, in some cases, you can just add an environment variable to allow people to opt out. In some cases, that's not possible. In some cases, like the Scarf.js example I brought up earlier, so in JavaScript, you have you know, like a package.json where you can provide some modifications in a manifest to allow for opt-out. That's not always possible either. Um, and you also need to pay attention to the fact that in some cases, uh, it'll be a human who's downloading it, but in some cases it may be like a CI pipeline or some other type of automated process. And um, again, paying attention to how you allow for opt-out uh, is, is nuanced. And it's like really specific to your particular piece of software. The one thing that kind of circumvents all of this is the idea that you could say, well, why don't we just do opt-in analytics instead? I mean, that does sidestep the issue. But at the end of the day, this goes back to that same idea about the surveys. It, it kind of sacrifices most of the value. If you're going to rely on people to say, hey, please track me, please gather this information about me, then you're going to get a much, much smaller number of people who are going to engage with that. And ultimately, it's going to be worse data as a result. And it's going to, it's going to result in you continuing to waste time trying to build the wrong pieces of the product because you don't know what the vast majority of people are doing with your project. Um, probably the most important of all of these things is just communication with your community. Um, I think it's really important just to consider, you know, where, where is your community when it comes to understanding analytics? This, I've seen this vary extremely widely across different communities. So there's some where 
like Apache Superset, one of the ones I mentioned earlier, they use data that, that we're helping them collect uh, on their usage, and they'll actually talk about this every single community meeting when they're trying to determine what direction to go with their project. Um, there are other projects that I've talked to before who are a lot more skittish or uncomfortable with being able to collect this kind of stuff. So just be aware of you know, who your community is. You know, suddenly adding a lot of analytics to a project that previously didn't have it could be problematic, but maybe not. You know, it's, it's also happened in cases that I've seen where that's just gone over totally fine. Um, making sure you understand how your project's goals, your community's goals, and if you work for a business that has to do with open source, how those things all interact with one another. I think being really clear and upfront about those goals and where they align and where they maybe are adjacent or opposing is really important. Um, I think it's important, of course, to make sure that the community knows why you're doing it, but also to know what they stand to benefit from it as well. Like at the end of the day, this is something that you want to do because uh, it will help hopefully everybody. And I think focusing on the things that uh, that are aligned amongst those different entities is going to be the right way to, to, do, to do this. And yeah, I would say that there's nothing wrong with aiming to commercialize an open source project. I think some of the folks in here had raised their hand for both maintainers of open source projects and startup founders. But you know, just make sure that you're upfront about what you're doing. Don't try to like sneak it in there and hide it under the, under the carpet. Just make sure that you know, you're managing expectations and you're avoiding bad surprises and you're paying attention to the needs of your community while also um, advocating for what you are looking for here. And yeah, just be transparent, which kind of goes into the communication thing as well. But you know, make sure you're clear about what you're collecting because the scale of things that you could be collecting could vary pretty widely. Uh, why you're collecting it, of course, when you're collecting it. Um, as mentioned earlier, collecting stuff at the point of download, collecting stuff after the download. These can have very different interpretations and in different communities, so making sure you're clear about that as well. Um, yeah, making sure you're clear about what you're going to do with the data once you have it, so you know whether that's determining where to host your community events or what events that your community should be attending or uh, yeah, some of these product feature related uh, benefits. Or if you are working on the open source project and you also have a business that sells something related to the open source project, making sure that you're handling that relationship tactfully. You know, don't just go spamming people with uh, stuff about your business. I mean, I'm sure your business is great, but you know, you want to make sure that you're uh, just, yeah, keep in mind that that relationship is one that you want to prioritize and you want to make sure that you aren't ever jeopardizing the, the closeness that you can have with the open source community uh, by, by overdoing it. And yeah, just keep in mind that being transparent in and of itself does not ensure a positive response. Um, it's necessary but not sufficient. So you'll also need to make sure that you're you know, considering all the other factors that we talked about today. Um, yeah, so you know, at the end of the day, I would say that without usage metrics, you are serving your community more poorly than you would be with them. Uh, you're missing out on value when it comes to both understanding the community, building the right product for them, uh, being able to offer them the right things, and you're probably wasting time as well. You're probably spending time on um, features and needs that may or may not actually be getting used. And without having a clear idea of what those metrics are and um, how your community is interacting with your product, you're just not going to be able to do that the best way that you can. Um, that said, keep in mind that these things can be done safely and ethically, and they should be done safely and ethically, and um, you know, probably the most important piece of that is paying attention to uh, expectations and communicating effectively. So yeah, thanks. Um, on the left side there, I have my LinkedIn, and the right side is Scarf website, so if you want to check us out, let us know. Thanks. Any questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, do you work with the Chaos community, the Linux Foundation project that does something very similar for community health and open source? Uh, you mean? Uh, 
chaos with two S's, right? The chaos with two S's, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So we do work with some of the folks there. Um, their analytics are a little bit different than ours. So sometimes they're more focused on um, understanding some of these, I guess, signals that are coming through different third parties. Like for instance, people who are interacting on GitHub or people who are interacting in Slack channels. I think that stuff is still valuable, but um, I guess some of the differences in what we do at Scarf and what they do is we're a little bit more focused on like download metrics or usage metrics. So what are people doing when they actually use the software? Uh, but we, we do partner with them. And actually we have a, a Biturgia, which is like a company that um, commercializes some of the stuff around uh, Chaos. We have a partnership with them. So yeah, happy to talk more about that in one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, besides the GDPR, are there any other data protection laws that we'd have to abide by? Um, yeah, great question. So I guess uh, maybe I would start off by saying that GDPR is an important law to pay attention to. Um, obviously, yeah, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, it's you, you would need to talk to your legal team about whether or not GDPR is even something that you need to abide by. Like if you don't operate in the EU, then it's not actually a relevant law for you, right? But obviously if you do, then you need to pay attention to it. And on a similar note, some of the other laws that come into play are CCPA, it's like kind of similar to GDPR, but for California operations, and then Canada has a somewhat similar law. So there are some of these sort of geographically specific laws um, but in all those cases, I would, I would definitely just make sure that you understand um, for your open source project or the company that you're working at that depending on the type of software you're providing, the type of data you're looking to collect, and the geographies where you're planning to operate, some combination of those things will help you determine which ones need to be paid attention to. But yeah, generally speaking, GDPR is probably the most commonly referenced law. Uh, thanks for the talk. Do you consider search engines like Google or chatbots like ChatGPT as your competitor? Because uh, when people face some problems with software, the first thing they do, they go ask the Google, or now they ask ChatGPT how to solve this problem or another. Do you think these services can start selling this as a statistics, as a insights about using software? <laughs> um, maybe, yeah, it's kind of an interesting idea. I think. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously, I, I, don't, I, I neither work for Google nor OpenAI, so I'm not sure what their uh, like go-to-market strategies will be with those things. But you know, there are tons of tools out there that can gather data on human behavior, generally speaking. And I think Google and OpenAI or ChatGPT are, are really good tools for doing so. I would say that historically, well. OpenAI, there's not so much of a concept of historically. Obviously, everything they're doing is like, it's it's harder to be able to predict what they're going to do. But I would say like Google, for example, historically has not played that much in that space, I would say. Um, and I guess the, the thing that I've noticed with any of these other um, sort of like mm, usage intelligence type of things is that if they're not focused on open source specifically, then they find it a lot harder to manage some of the compliance issues and some of the like privacy guidelines and honestly even like the open source community expectations that come in this space. So that's something that, yeah, I guess I'm not, not necessarily here to pitch scar for anything, but I would say that's something that we have a lot of experience with and something that we can generally um, manage more uh, like, What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know, just like more specifically for the open source community than uh, some of those other folks. But yeah, it's possible they try to do that too. <laughs> So do you have any examples of uh, projects that have decided to implement uh, data collection and 
uh, kind of what good looks like or how they go about doing it and how they kind of communicate with their community um, and, and either even even just even also potentially in the commercial space as well too yeah absolutely I have uh, I have tons <laughs> um, yeah I don't know if this is like the right environment to actually bring them up but we can definitely talk later yeah yeah for sure and actually like even on our scarf website we have a lot of case studies as well so I think two of the ones I mentioned there, like Apache Superset and Apache Airflow are both super popular ASF projects. There's a lot of other ones like that that are using SCARF. And I guess the nice, th or using SCARF to collect data. There are also many projects that are not using SCARF to collect data that uh, are worth looking into. But yeah, I mean, other Apache projects that come to mind are like Apache Hoodie, Apache DevLake, um, Apache Sedona. There's also a lot of Linux Foundation projects that are using SCARF. So ones like Cert Manager, Dapper, Linkerd, Fluent, Litmus Chaos. I feel like I'm kind of just name dropping here, but um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of projects out there that are doing it nowadays, and they're, I would argue, doing it in a responsible way. There are also projects that we've seen who have tried to do it and have run into some of that backlash, maybe because they weren't paying attention to some of these concerns and. Um, have therefore maybe come to us or come to other folks to try to get this done in a more, uh, I don't know, like a smoother manner, I guess. And I think I brought up some of the license chain stuff earlier. I think the idea that, you know, there are changes happening in the open source community and some people are deciding that moving away from like, quote unquote, open source is the way to solve the problems they're looking for. and. I think that this can be frustrating for some people. Um, and I would say that this is potentially an alternative solution to doing that. It's like a way to be able to get some of the stuff that you need and that you want uh, without needing to not be open source. Um, and you know, therefore, there are a lot of open source projects that have had success doing it this way. Thank, thank you, Arjun. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, everyone.